And we are officially live. Welcome everybody to the third episode of On Mental Health and Creativity, a collaboration with Made of Millions. My name is Megan, I'm gonna be your host and I'm the founder and director of 2020 Arts and we produce art focused campaigns that raise awareness for homelessness addiction and of course, mental health. Today we are very lucky to be joined by Fang Nguyen who is a practicing artist who is also a certified art therapist which is a really interesting a um, mix of professions. And so I'm gonna kind of just dive right into this um, mm -hmm. and ask one of the hardest questions I think I've ever been asked. Tell us a little bit about yourself without telling us what you do. Yeah, that's a bit hard. <laughs> I totally get why that's a hard thing. Um, it's really hard to, to separate what I do from who I am. I feel like that's like a pretty integral part of me. Totally um, but I feel like that's like the easy, the easy way out to answer this question. Um, I was born and raised in Toronto, um, and my parents were Vietnamese immigrants. They were refugees from the war, so I grew up in a very diasporic community. Um, a, a kind of like the usual story: life is different at home than, and life is different at school. Like there's like the dual duality, the dual world. And um, navigating that was like a big part of my childhood. But as uh, tough what it was when I, tough as it was when I was younger, it definitely gave me perspective. Looking back on it, whatever that perspective was, um, I oh, I was going to talk about art. I was because that's <laughs> what, what I do. Um, I like to think I am creative, and I like to think that I uh, and I do like. I, my relationships are pretty valuable to me. My relationships with my, my family, my friends, my partner. Um, what else did I do? <laughs> I am very curious, very awkward. And I like to stay active to handle my stress, I think, aside from the art stuff. I feel like it's already a very <laughs> question, but it's also a blessing in a way that it's very difficult to separate what you do from who you are. Um, if what you do is what you love, then they're going to be intermingled. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like that's one of the most difficult questions. Um, but as, when, was, when did you first start getting into art then? Let's, let's dive into that side of your passion. How did you first get introduced to it? What medium was it? Um, and when did you know that you wanted to be an artist? Yeah, I feel that kind of goes hand in hand with like my difficulty in the first question. Um, I was one of those kids who just never stopped drawing. Yeah. Um, I think I was, a, I was a pretty quiet kid and in a lot of ways that's still a part of me. Um, so a lot of, I don't remember the first thing I picked up because it's, it's always been a part of my childhood um, all throughout high school. And then of course I went to school for art. I went to OCAD for drawing and painting. Um, so it's always, it's always been there. And I, I don't really remember a time when it hasn't been. That's amazing. It was, yeah. and you were meant to be an artist. Kind of, and I wasn't really much good at much else, so, <laughs> so that, that might have been part of the narrative as well. Like, not really, not much else really caught my attention. Yeah, that's amazing, though. So, when did you first learn about art therapy? Then, yeah, um, so this I first came across it during like researching when I was in high school, like what to do with make with this passion that I have for art. Um, it's like I come from a fairly conservative family when it comes to careers and decision making in terms of like the future. Um, I'm not really the doctor or engineer of my parents' dreams, and that's why. So I wanted to find something that was more stable and would provide me a bit more um, like financial relief, rather because I feel like an artist is no notoriously lives like a very uh, turbulent life. Um, so that's when I first came across it, but at the time I didn't really feel like it was for me because I never really knew much about mental health and psychology and that sort of, that, that really huge part of art therapy. So I just figured I'd go to art school and then future me will figure it out. 
and somehow I did. Um, when I was a practicing artist, I would exhibit, um, and there's an auction called Art Gems, mm -hmm. which is um, a fundraising auction for Creative Work Studio, and um, they were raising money for the art therapy program and reached out to me and invited me to submit a, a painting for auction for the fundraiser. And I've done that in 2017 and 2018, I believe. And that's kind of when I was exposed more to it. And um, they had some speakers from the program talk about their experiences and I, I was kind of touched by it, I think. Yeah. So I decided to look into it more and it just seemed to align with everything I wanted to do as an artist. Um, I feel like the topics I tend to gravitate towards or the things that really like fuel me or get me going um, really do fall into the, the themes of social justice. Mm. Um, so, but I, I wasn't feeling I was connecting with people in a way that I wanted to through artwork. And maybe I'm being hard on myself. Maybe um, I sh I'm too critical about the impact of my artwork, but art therapy seemed to make sense. Mm -hmm. as in terms of like a purpose and not just only a purpose within my artwork but my own purpose I guess as yeah. someone who's creative and cares for people I care for people <laughs> yeah that makes total sense um I wonder so Made a Million just had a campaign called No One Told Me and it addresses the uh, gap between the treatment gap between when people recognize that they have mental health issues and then seeking out help. Um, so I wonder, do you remember the first time you learned about mental health? And was that something that you knew about growing up? Was it something that was shared with you? Did you ever receive any sort of formal introduction to what mental health was? I would say no, not really. No. Um, when I was in high school, maybe I'm aging myself. But there wasn't really much discussion about mental health and mental illness, mental wellness, um, or self-care or things like that. Like it wasn't really a part of the dialogue, maybe more so on the internet as people, as it becomes more and more um, discussed. Like it's, it just kind of eased in into like everyday thinking, I think, like being aware of depression, and anxiety, and how, and how to be there for the people in your life that may experience it, may experience um, uh, issues within their own mental health. Um, but I don't remember like any specific moment. I even took like, psychology in high school and it wasn't, um, it talked about mental health as if people who had it have had disorders, not so much like every day or any practical advice for things like that. Hmm. Yeah. So when did you start sort of learning about it? Um, and oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, that would have been more so from personal experience, I think. Um, I come from a fairly conservative family that's kind of traditional in um, ways of thinking, especially about mental health, which is not much. Um, and I've had family members who, like I hold really, really close to me that are have gone through and are going through not so great experiences with their own mental health and have trouble finding help and trouble finding support within our own family. Um, a lot of Vietnamese people like don't really understand what it is, how to support it, how to help it and how to understand it mm -hmm. and how to understand people who do have it. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest like personal experiences that led me to to realize like the impact of it and the complications of it and things like that um, had to do from my own, had to come from my own learning, trying to understand like certain family members who, who were, who were really struggling. Mm. And has your path towards our therapy changed those conversations with your friends and family members around mental health? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think so. I don't really talk more about it now. Um, but I feel like it's kind of given me the, not only like the language to talk about it, mm. but how to navigate mental health in the context of race or in the context of ethnicity or gender, things like that. Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to art therapy, I think there are a lot of misconceptions. I would say that it's a slightly newer form of therapy. Um, 
what are some of the misconceptions around what art therapy is and what is art therapy? Right, okay, so um, I'll tell you about what it is and then the misconceptions because um, like I've definitely experienced, experienced the misconceptions myself. I definitely carried it with me when I was doing my own formal training. Um, in Ontario, art therapy is a form of psychotherapy. So when it's practiced here, it's very much um, connected as in like it's traditionally it is very Freudian, like the kind of talk therapy that one imagines when you're going through therapy. Though there is art making involved and the art making is used as like um, another way of expression or another method of self-soothing or a coping um, strategy. So that's what it is. There's like, uh, like formal elements, like the initial assessment of a client and there is the, uh, um, production of a course of action, right. um, goals to be, that a client may want to reach. And there's um, the actual relationship between the client and the therapist. Um, so that's like in a formal sense, like that's what art therapy is. Um, and it's a, it is a fairly new, a new field, a new kind of therapy. So I feel like the misconceptions of it is that it's a very like, um, uh, hippy dippy kind of like a form of healing mm -hmm. um and sometimes you need that kind of therapist sometimes you don't you got to see what works for you and um everyone needs someone different i think so um that's like a few i feel like that's a really um common one I, it was in the movie um parasite that came out recently one of the characters pretended to be an art therapist and she would um, look at like this kid's drawing and be like, oh, that sun symbolizes something or like this symbolizes that, but it's not really like that. Um, what We don't really look at people's artwork and be like, this tiny blade of grass represents um, childhood trauma because I feel like um, that uh, the language of symbols um, is a little bit different for everyone. Like that blade of grass might mean something in one cultural context, but something else in a totally different cultural context. So that's like up to us to kind of navigate um, a client's visual language. So it's not like a, we're not gonna look at something like, yeah, this kid is a psychopath because that <laughs> not, 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 might not necessarily be the case. Um, yeah. Another example of what it isn't, and I, and I feel like this is pretty common, I still see it in bookstores today, is coloring books that say that they're art therapy. And I feel like it's like, um, and a lot of things are therapeutic. Art making is very therapeutic. Listening to music, um, being active, going for a run, things like that are considered to be very therapeutic because they are very helpful and self-soothing. But they, things like uh, a coloring book saying that it is art therapy, might, it might not necessarily be the case because it doesn't have the formal requirements that's in traditional therapy, like a relationship to a therapist that can help guide certain emotions. But don't get me wrong, they're very therapeutic things. So if you still do them to um, to not stress out, to calm yourself down, to give yourself some time for yourself, by all means, still do them. Um, but I feel like titles like that on coloring books is a bit detrimental, maybe a bit harmful to what um, the field really is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it definitely creates a little bit more confusion for people who don't know what art therapy is. And then when they see that, they might think that there's, that it's much more general, but it's something much more specific. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about what an art therapy session looks like. Uh, oh. Nothing specific, no person in specific, but sort of just take us through like what those steps look like in comparison to a regular therapy session. Yeah, of course. Um... So a lot of my one-on-one -on -one sessions are structured similarly, depending on the client and their need for the day. I like to do a check-in, see how you're doing, anything urgent, is there something you wanna, or we should carry on from last week? Um, there's some art making in the middle. Mm -hmm. like, um, and people use art making in a few different ways. I know clients who um, just use it specifically to, to calm themselves down, to just give themselves some time to take a breath and take some time for themselves. Um, and I know other clients who use it as like to be more expressive. So they might be, um, it, it might like 
not supplement, but like in addition to like how they talk about their feelings or how, how they might represent their feelings and gives them another dimension of communication. Um, I feel like that works especially with uh, people from communities that don't talk about mental health or don't talk about um, yourself really, where it's like impolite to talk about yourself and your, your own feelings and your own struggles. So um, even just like using the words or pulling, it's kind of feel, kind of feels like pulling teeth sometimes. So like the art really helps with that because it's not a verbal expression and you might not necessarily feel as self-conscious as you would if you come from a place of like a lot of um, criticism for focusing on yourself. Mm. And so that that's usually like, the middle piece for me so far anyway and the last we do uh another check-in see what you feel like see what the work makes you feel like what do you feel look how do you feel looking at it um and then we talk about the work talk about the process um talk 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 some more <laughs> and then and then we close off and sometimes i'll give them uh homework but most of the times i don't Unless they, unless I feel like it's necessary to keep things going during the weeks in between. Hmm. Um, so that's like my usual one-on-one -on -one kind of format, I guess. Um, but I, what I really love doing is groups. I love art therapy groups. Hmm. Um, I feel like the connection between people is there. The support is there. You can see, um, like maybe even strangers at first, like really supporting each other in their work and like encouraging people. Hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. So how do you figure out what medium to use? Like what medium do you use? Are you open if somebody wants to use something like clay or some other type of medium? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty open. Um, I feel like some schools of thought have a pretty standardized like 18 by 24 inch piece of paper when you're drawing. Um, but for me, I, I kind of like gauge it, see how, see what kind of the client needs um, without, yeah. So like if someone is coming in with like a lot of big feelings, a lot of like, I'm not very grounded, like I might have them do something a bit smaller that might be more contained and it's a bit more um, like ask some more focus from them. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas something like that's, a really big piece of paper the size the size of a wall might be a bit overwhelming and you can't see the edges of the paper when you're really close to it and you can get lost in it and might regress so it, it really depends on the client i try to keep an open mind but um there's sometimes it's like you know let's let's do something small today let's do a little piece of clay instead of like a big um sculpture but definitely open to a lot of different supplies i noticed that um people in I mean, I've only really worked in Vancouver and Toronto, um, but natural materials, when it's not really accessible, like seashells and wood and things like that, like really gravitate, some people really gravitate towards it because they're not really like objects you find lying on the ground in the middle of the city. Yeah. So it's like they almost take their experience outside of the, the therapy session and then they bring it into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I'll bring some like random objects in, and if it calls for it calls to people, then it calls to them. This might be a silly question, but do you think that people who is everybody creative? I suppose is the question. <laughs> yeah, um, I do get a lot of I do get a lot of oh, I'm not a creative person. Oh, like I'm not really good at art. I can't even draw a stick figure. I feel like that's like the, the common thing you hear, but. I feel like everyone has the potential to be creative, to be open, because it's not necessarily about creativity or skill even, like it might be more about openness to experiences mm -hmm. because creativity demands a lot of imagination and a, and it might not, yeah, it might not even be about skill or to think outside of the box that I feel like creativity and imagination demands, but just openness to it. So I don't think anyone specifically has to feel like they're a creative person to do something like art therapy. Um, just open to the possibility of novelty and maybe like uncomfortable experiences because therapy is uncomfortable and art making is also uncomfortable. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's one of those one of those things. I, I see, um, 
I was reading a book called The, the Body Keeps the Score, and mm -hmm. they talk about um, individuals with PTSD and how um, it hinders, not hinders, but it um, slows down a part of the brain that uh, has to do with imagination and creativity um, and how a lot of individuals with PTSD struggle with imagining a future or like imagining a um like a, a better place than where they are at right now because there's lots of uh, lingering in the past and past traumas. Um, so something like art therapy might be a bit of a struggle when there's like a biological factor that might be um, causing some difficulties. But yeah, yeah th there's a lot of there's a lot of research out right now. But I always say like. Um, if you don't feel like you're a creative person or if you don't feel like you are open, like you don't have to do something that um, might be the hard way to do something. Yeah. Like there's a lot of different ways of therapy, sorry, lot, lots of different um, types of therapy that might be better suited for you and things like that. Definitely. I, as somebody who has practiced art uh, in the past, there is a degree of anxiety associated with just getting started. Yeah. And there's the fear of the blank page. And so if somebody's coming to you, they've never painted before, they never drawn before, maybe they've never molded anything before. Um, what are some of the, like, the tools and techniques you use to help people get over that first hurdle of just getting started? Right, and that's like a that's a real fear for I guess um, artists and people who, and also people who don't associate too much with like making art. Like that's <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a real one um, from my own experiences as well. There's a few, a few different things that I'll do. Um, I'll kind of encourage them to be playful, to be silly, to like do like a body movement that they might not necessarily do because it's not socially acceptable to do stuff like that in public. Um, <laughs> so like loosen, loosen up um, where you are emotionally and physically, I feel like it might help people be more open to putting a mark on the page. Um, I can, I also like will provide a prompt sometimes like draw a place that you feel the most safe or draw or describe to me where the last time you felt w really welcomed in a place like just just like prompts to get something going and i know i've noticed this for um a lot of creative people who i work with um who i work with art therapy with who i work on art therapy with um they there's a lot of anxiety when it comes to making something that has to look good and the purpose of art, art therapy is kind of in the therapy the art is kind of like a vessel to get you there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not about making something that looks good. And that's really hard. Um, for me personally, it was like pulling teeth. Like I could not, it had to look at least passable yeah. for me because I was used to thinking about art in an academic sort of sense um, where I had to look a certain way, say a certain thing and be very, very specific with this intention. But in therapy, the intention is to help you feel better. Like at the end of the day, it's not about the way it looks. It's about where it's taking you. Um, and that can be like a really hard thing to separate for someone who's um, really uh, heavily focused on the aesthetics of something. Um, so I'll do some, I'll prompt like make something ugly, <laughs> make something like just terrible, just get it out of your system. Um, if you feel like it's gonna look terrible anyway, let's see what that's gonna look like. Or um, I'll suggest a totally new material. If you're someone who never touches collage, then let's do something like that. There's no expectations for you to do well because it's something you've never done before. So there's a very low threshold for disappointment, <laughs> um, which is terrible saying it like that, but it really helps people kind of get out of their head. I think yeah. there's a lot of like being stuck in here that happens. Yeah, so as somebody who started out as a practicing artist, you went to OCAD for drawing and painting, very used to creating an image based on the final product, what is this gonna look like? How am I going to present this? How has becoming a certified art therapist changed your own practice as an artist or has it? Yeah, um, it definitely has. I'm definitely one of those artists that like really absorbs everything around me. Maybe I'm more like of a journalist in that sort of way. 
but like I, I've taken a lot of things and like art therapy has really changed my practice. Mm. Um, I've st stopped kind of like planning uh, what ideas I'm gonna try to flesh out. Like this is gonna look like this because I'm gonna talk about this and conceptually it makes sense this way and this sort of language that doesn't really make sense to many people but myself. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, recently, uh, recently as in the past few years, um, which is also the time I've been getting into this art therapy world, that I've been making artwork just based on the things I see, the things around me, and not really thinking about the body of work or like the series of paintings or the series of whatever. Um, and I've been just like, I just keep on doing hmm. without really like a, a goal in mind at the end. And it's kind of like research, like data gathering. Um, because at the end of the year, I'll take a look back at everything I did and be like, what's going on? What, like, humans love patterns. So I'll look at, like, reoccurring themes, reoccurring colors, um, what sort of imagery is, like, present in a lot of them. And, like, at first, the purpose of that was to see what I wanted to say, where I wanted to go with my artwork. But looking at it, I realized, like, man, it's a lot of me out there. So, like, I look at, like, these paintings, it's like, oh this is something I've been dwelling on for a while, or like this is clearly something that's important to me because it's appeared so many times without me really thinking about it or like realizing it. So it's a, right now my art practice is very self-reflective mm -hmm. and self-indulgent. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's what it is. I've been a lot more observant. I like to draw the world around me a lot more mm -hmm. um, and whether that's to, process or understand it or just enjoy a thing for what it is I feel like that kind of depends on the day yeah, yeah. Have, do you remember using art as a form of therapy for yourself before learning more about art therapy or was it primarily as a profession I think it was mostly as a profession OCAD kind of like drilled that into me um <laughs> And then afterwards, but it was it was definitely like within the past few years where I've definitely used it for more self learning, and um, in in that sense more therapeutic and less stressful. <laughs> it was definitely less stressful once I embraced that part. The fun, the fun is back for me. Mm. Not that it wasn't ever fun because I can get lost in the painting forever, but it's it's definitely different. It's definitely different now. I've heard from a lot of artists that when you start to monetize your art or you start to have to do commissions or you're creating a specific body of work for a specific show and you have to create, that it takes a little bit of the fun and love of the art out of it. Did you uh, find that when you were producing bodies of work before becoming introduced to art therapy? No, I can't I can't say I have. Um I've like I love um I love Okay, I don't love deadlines, but I love feeling the rush of things, you know? It's like, I don't have one day left to do this thing, I'm just gonna do it. And it's very like exciting for me. I don't know why I really enjoy that sort of pressure sometimes. Um, or like working within parameters, I feel like I can be creative in a different sort of way when there's like a certain set of rules that I have to work around and forces you to think differently. So I kind of like see those as more of a challenge rather than um, and I see a lot of joy in challenges. Mm -hmm. I think. Our episode last week with Apanaki, she said the exact same thing that she yeah. really loves deadlines. That she lo and she also puts things to off to the very end until she's under extreme pressure because it allows her to create in a different way. So ah. maybe it's an artist thing. Maybe I can definitely relate to that to some extent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Aside from the art therapy side of things, let's talk a little bit about your own artistic practice. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of, obviously you take in the influence that's around you. It's sort of like a journal for you in a way. It's very self-reflective. But can you tell us a little bit more about it and how it's evolved over the years? Yeah. Um, I think one of the bodies of work is linked into the comments. Um, but it definitely started off with uh, the sleeping or the sleepless. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna share it. So this is my first time screen sharing. So everybody bear with me, but I'm gonna bring it up just so we have a visual aid, um, just so we can see what the, what the work looks like. Okay. Okay. Here we are. 
Can you see this? Yeah, I see it. It's happening. Okay. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the series that you're talking about. So you can go ahead. Just tell us a little bit about this series and Yeah. So this is um my first it started during my move, or not my move, rather my settling in to a different city. Um, Vancouver is a beautiful, beautiful city, and it's always going to be have like a really special place in me. I feel like I've grown a lot when I lived there, um, but it was it was definitely tough. I like I'm used to the stereotypical East Coast Toronto pacing of like I got four things to do today every day. <laughs> and maybe I'll take an hour of self-care, which is just a nap on the TTC on my commute somewhere. But like there's um, Vancouver is a much more slower paced city, um, even though it's still like quite bustling. Mm -hmm. um, and it forced me to really take some time from myself, even though I didn't want, <laughs> even though I didn't want to, I was pretty resistant to it. Um, Cause I was used to filling up my time and go, go, go. And I kind of realized that uh, what was I, why was I so busy? Like what, what was I avoiding by being this busy? Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely hit me in the face when I was there and I wasn't busy. It's like, oh, dealing with my own feelings, my, my yeah. own self-perception, things, habits that I kind of let go or have been lenient on because I was so busy being busy. It kind of verified like neglect and sort of like my own self-care. Mm -hmm. and um things like that so s sleep had a had a very complicated relationship while I was there it definitely altered my moods it was more irregular because I was a student and working part-time even though I was busy it my schedule was not um stable to have like a proper sleeping a sleep schedule so that really had me like face or forced me to like work with myself and things I've been avoiding for what was apparently a long time. <laughs> yeah, and that looking at the paintings like after is like, yeah, they all fit together because that was what I was dealing with at the time. Just a couple comments. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I I love this body of work. I, I if anybody wants to see it, I've just left the link in. I don't just like copy and paste it. I don't know that you can click it from the comments there, um, but we'll be going through a couple different bodies of work. And also if anybody has any questions or comments or anything throughout this discussion, feel free to leave them there and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the discussion. Um, but the transition of moving from one city to another in and of itself is pretty difficult. Um, and then what you're talking about, about everything slowing down, I think a lot of people can probably relate to that with everything that's just happened with yeah. the pandemic. Um, and so you've got a little bit of a pre-taste, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess so. Of what that was like. And so was the process of sort of evaluating those feelings through this body of work very therapeutic for you to work through some of those, some of those ideas? I'm gonna say yes and no. It was, I think the most um, impactful part about making the bodies of the world was looking at them and be like, I got some things to fix. <laughs> we were like, oh my God, I, like this is not a person who's okay right now. Mm -hmm. So having that clarity was definitely a push to be like, you've always known there were some things you needed to work on. Here it is. And now you got to do it. And I, I feel like I'm a lot more... Um, because of it, like I, I'm a lot more aware of habits that I let slip, like my own um, discipline with my sleeping schedule and things like that. So it might not necessarily have helped me um, release a lot of my anxieties about any particular thing, because I, I'm a, one of those people who don't feel, who don't really feel relieved from anxiety until I do something about it. Like it's normally like a task, like, and I won't feel calm until that task is done. Um, but I, you know, even that's gone be a bit better, I think, <laughs> even that's gone a bit better. So it's yeah. definitely, definitely a good start. Uh, and you were, you were in Vancouver for, sorry, how long? I was there for a year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. Um, and during that time you created this body of work, obviously, but then you also created Hastings and Pain. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What brought about the idea to create this body of work? 
Yeah, um, this one was is particularly special to me. Um, when I was living, working, and schooling in Vancouver, I worked at a shelter. Um, it's called First United. It's on Hastings and Gore, um, but really close to Hastings and Maine. So the joke between us and like the members of the community was that they called it Hastings and Pain, because if anyone's been in that neighborhood or have been around the community, there's a lot of a lot of suffering that happens there. And it's out there. Um, it's a lot of heavy uh, substance use, and it's the center of Canada's opioid crisis. Um, and working at that shelter, it's really changed changed my life forever. I think. Um, so the body of work didn't come again, like intentionally. It just started off with like me on a midnight shift, kind of doodling because everyone in the shelter is sleeping, so there's yeah. not really much to do. So I would draw things I see, and um, some images just kind of like stick with you. So after drawing, I would start like taking pictures of things just really quickly on my phone mm. um, and then drawing from the phone images because um, even then sometimes it's a bit, the neighborhood can be kind of dangerous. So I can't spend too much time in one spot without feeling uncomfortable sometimes, even though I've worked there for quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, super, super important to me. I One of the big problems is that um, homeless people don't necessarily want to be outed as homeless or made public that they are suffering. Right. Um, and there are quite a bit of people who ran away from home, ran away from abusive relationships, um, had to escape a certain situation. So I, I felt like doing portraits of people could potentially like put them in danger or like maybe someone out there who's looking for them who's not who doesn't have the best intentions can find out that oh they're in this neighborhood like oh i've seen them because it was published in the, in the paper like i've seen them in this paper over here i'm going to go look for looking for them over there mm -hmm. um so i really wanted to keep the identities out of the picture literally yeah but I didn't want to lose the humanity in it. I feel like a lot of the times when faces and identities are excluded from figurative work, it um, the person depicted becomes more of a symbol of something rather than a story about the actual person could because their identity is gone. Yeah. Um, so that was like a big part of like the hassle, not the hassle, like the the conflict for me when I was making these drawings and watercolors and paintings mm -hmm. um, because I still wanted it to, to feel very human. And I don't, I'm not sure if I got that, but that's something I'm definitely working on even right now. I think even with like these two works um, here, it's almost like you, you feel the presence of the individual that was in that space. Um, so I think, I think you're definitely successful <laughs> in that you definitely get a feeling of, of, oh, it's taking a little while to load here, but you definitely get a feeling for it, especially if you're somebody who lives in a sitting city, you've seen the tents uh, right now, there are obviously tents up in Moss Park. And so it is a, unfortunately, universal experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful body of work. Can you tell us a little bit about your time working for that shelter, some of those experiences? Yeah, I could, I could go on forever. Um, I always talk about how it's how it changed me, but I really loved making relationships with people, like getting to know their story, being being there mm. for them when they like when some people haven't had a good day, or like um, just wanted someone to talk to that wasn't about um, all the negativity that they were around, um, and I. I don't even know where to start because <laughs> I've had some of the best relationships with people. Um, it really changed my perception mm. on homelessness, addictions, um, where it comes from, why people are struggling with it or are struggling to find help. Um, but it was mostly the the relationships with the community members and the shelter residents and even my coworkers that's really changed um, changed my experiences. I feel like it was definitely just as impactful to me as a person as like my art therapy training was um i'm a i'm a pro unfortunately at um getting bear spray out of people's eyes um i can i'm really good at uh, administering narcan um and things like that like i love 
I really loved working there. It taught me a lot about myself, my own boundaries. Um, uh, the necessity to be firm when it's required of you to be firm in that situation, mm -hmm. to hold your ground, or and when to be softer as well. I feel like that was a big one. And kind of like, even on a broader level, what it really means to be kind. Um, sometimes kindness looks ugly. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard. Um, and even on a broader level, I think, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but I, I think I found something down there, some sort of something that I don't believe in. Um, I'm not a person of faith. And I'm not, a, again, I'm not a very spiritual person, but I, I really believe in, in people. <laughs> I believe in like our willingness to connect with others and how, um, how at the end of the day, like all, all, that's all a lot of us really need is connection, is relationship, it's, it's love. And maybe that's the West Coast softness seeping in me. Maybe I got, maybe Vancouver made me really soft. But that's, that's what it is. I think that's um, a good thing, probably. <laughs> maybe, maybe. What was one of the biggest mis misconceptions that you had going into that situation? That, you know, I've always known it, but I think that one of the biggest misconceptions is that, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I was just really overwhelmed by the amount of people struggling about the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, probably the amount of, at the core of it all, like I never realized how how lonely a lot of people struggling with addictions or substance use um, experience. Um, I've always learned that it was a lot of uh, different uh, sources. Like maybe someone had um, had a a spinal injury and went to the hospital and they had to they were given this medication and now they're hooked and they can't they don't have the support to get out um or maybe because they were um in a social setting when they were younger and can't have a hard time getting out of like that cycle um but a lot of it has to do with dependence on um sorry lack of dependence on a community or a group of people a like a support system um i never really realized how powerful like communities and groups were in supporting an individual like i, I feel like there's a lot of emphasis on self-care and taking care of yourself and and it's true like you're the one responsible for your wellness but there's not as much emphasis on community care and how much how big it is when we have the support system to be there for us when we're down to be open and understand us when we don't feel like we can connect with anyone. Mm -hmm. Kind of, yeah, take us out of that. That was probably the biggest misconception. How um, I underestimated like the impact of community and how many lonely people there were that suffered with substance use. Mm -hmm. Was the shelter a place of community for those individuals? Yeah, I want to say yeah. <laughs> yeah, they know they can go there to to sleep during the day because they've stayed up all night worrying or one thing or the other mm -hmm. um and they know they can get bread there most days sometimes not on wednesdays they know they can get breakfast there a coffee um and to be around other people um i feel like when you're suffering with substance use and mental health there's a ton of concurrent um con issues down there that's not only about substance use but about the relationship between mental illness and substances. Um, it's a really tempting thing to do to isolate yourself, um, but being there and like having other people, having conversation over coffee about the weather, like really simple things, talking about sports. People love the connects over there. Um, like, and having a normal day, like a, a day that's as normal as it can get really is super important. Hmm. So I imagine there was a little bit of, was there an emotional toll that that work took on you near the beginning? Um, yeah, I would say so. It took a while for it to catch up to me, I think. I compartmentalized uh, pretty well without really realizing it. Um, the toll kind of happened more so by maybe like a few months in 
when um, loud noises would make me jumpy or like um, sirens, like it's not, or like sirens would like tense me up because there was a lot of that um, all day and all night over there. Um, and like, if I pass by someone on the street, I, I, I always have to make sure, like even quickly to make sure I can still see them breathing in case of an overdose. Like there's a lot of um, that, that became habit even only after a few months. So that was the toll. Mm -hmm. But working with people was never really difficult for me. Um, I've never felt too burnt out by someone's story or someone's struggle. Like it's never, um, yeah, not that it's not gonna happen because over time burnout does happen. Um, compassion fatigue happens. But I think I've been pretty lucky to have like a good support system and to like learn to be a bit more um, aware of my feelings. Mm -hmm. We can all we can all do better, but I, <laughs> you know, we can all do better. Um, but I think I was definitely one of the lucky ones to, because at the end of the day, um, as sad as it is, and I, I still feel um, like some unreasonable guilt because of it. But at the end of the day, I can. I can leave the neighborhood and leave the shelter and go home to like a safe bed. I know at the end of the day, like I'm one of the lucky ones that I um, like don't have to stay there or sleep on the street or have this dependency on a substance that I hate. Mm -hmm. um, so that like that gratefulness um, and also that feeling of guilt, like it, at the end of the day, like I know I'll be fine. And I think that kind of helped me get through um, like a lot of emotional, <laughs> a lot of emotional experiences. That's for sure. Yeah. What are some of the like tools and techniques that you've used over the years to maintain that degree of mental clarity and to stay level when going through these experiences or going through the difficulty of when you first moved to Vancouver? What are some of those tools and tips? Do you um, have I, I feel like a lot of the times I've been, I've been blessed with like a, a strangely calm mind. <laughs> like, of course, I do get stressed about things. And of course, like situations um, can be difficult to navigate through. But I feel like a, a lot of the times I'm pretty level headed. I'm not really sure why. Uh, <laughs> um, but the big thing that I learned is um, mindfulness. Mm. And I'm not, I don't, uh, practice meditation on the daily um, and it's a pretty rare occurrence for me um, but to be just to snap out of the situation for a second be like this is what's going on right now I am sitting at this desk I'm on the computer I'm talking to you um, I'm not worried about the future I'm not worried about things that I've regret talking about before in the past um, that's that's really how like what's going on right now because um getting out of your head of like things that are buzzing that might just interfere with how you're living your life is a really important piece i think for every for everyday living especially because we're all surrounded by all this information all the time what do what how can we process it all <laughs> without going a little bit crazy yeah when was the first time you either decided to be mindful or learned about mindfulness um, on a more formal level, it was during my education, I think, but um, it was probably, it was probably at the shelter when I first was like, okay, this is fine, you're not in danger, this is fine. Um, there was a resident in um, a bathroom, and she's she was severely, uh, I'm pretty sure it was schizophrenia, um, and she spoke in two different voices. And the voices were very, very different from each other. I was convinced that there was two people in the, in the washroom, but it wasn't. But I had to muster up some courage to, to get there and, be, and just knock on the door and be like, hey, is everything okay? Are you all right? Like, you've been there for a while. Um, is there anything I can help you with? What's going on? But it was just one person. And I didn't really have much to be scared of after that, I think. But it's a lot of like in your, in your head at the moment. Um, yeah. I think that was like probably the most, the first notable time that I was like, I can do this, <laughs> I can do this. Yeah. Do deep, does deep breathing help you stay present? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Um, I think that comes with the mindfulness piece. Like you're, 
adrenaline is going when you're stressed out or when you're anxious about something. And the more slow breaths you take, the deeper breaths you take, the oxygen, the more oxygen you literally take in to slow down the rate of your heart. So on a biological level, like that really helps me. Um, yeah, that really helps me just like, just let it, just let it go, it's okay. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, so we have technically 10 minutes or so left. Okay. So for anybody who's watching or listening, uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask, definitely ask them. We'll try to get to them. Um, comments, whatever it is that you want to share, if there's anything you think that we haven't really covered. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to ask was, do you think that art therapy can replace traditional therapy? Um, yeah, and what are the comparative benefits of both? Right. Um, I think I might have mentioned this before, but it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. It's not going to like work for everyone. There's quite a few different types of therapies out there mm -hmm. that might work best for someone else. Um, I really specifically enjoy sorry like i've specifically pursued art therapy because of my art background but i realized like the benefits of it um is that okay i was gonna i, I always go on a rant i know we only have a few minutes left <laughs> but um um like in, in what we know as like the west we there's a lot of talking and therapy it's very like logically inclined kind of and a lot of discussion and dialogue that happens um mm -hmm during therapy but in other places of the world you don't really see as much of that there's a lot of talking and discussing not as formally as we have it structured here um, but there's a lot of other things that are considered to be healing dancing movement um, art making making music together doing things as a group um, weaving together telling stories together um, those are all legitimate forms Le legitimate forms of healing and art therapy kind of bridges that for me mm. because I like to work with not I like to work with I tend to work with people of color um and just the talking and the dialogue could be a bit uncomfortable for some people especially when they don't come from communities that allow that focus on yourself or allow you to to be selfish or like to focus on what's going on with you rather than what's going on with the collective whole. Mm -hmm. um, so for someone like me, who's come from an art background, who um, tends to be on a bit more creative side and who tends to work with people of color um, and a bunch of different communities, I've been pretty blessed, I think, to have these opportunities. Um, art making has really been helpful so far that I've seen hasn't been detrimental. Um, so I, it's, but again, it might not necessarily be for everyone, especially because art making can be anxious for a lot of people who like only draw sick people or like had a traumatic response to someone criticizing their work when they were younger. Um, mm -hmm. Or even when you're older, like I feel like cr criticism can be kind of traumatic sometimes. So in that case, like I'd recommend a different form of therapy, like traditional talk therapy or cognitive behavioral, or there's, there's a ton of different things out there. And I really think people should shop around and see what works best for them. Have you found that with your experience as an art therapist, that the people you've worked with have developed a love for creation and started doing it in their own time? Yeah, that tends to be the case, um, especially if they were creative prior. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love, I love, um, I love hearing that like of people doing their own thing in their own time, like creative endeavors or things that they would never normally imagine themselves doing. Hmm. I feel like that's a pretty um, good sign, I think. Yeah, definitely. Definitely that it was the right fit of therapy for them. Yeah, um, I, uh, when I was training, I worked at a residence for older adults on in Vancouver's downtown east side, the same neighborhood as the shelter, right across the street actually. And it was three hours twice a week, so six hours a week total mm -hmm. of a drop-in art therapy group. 
Um, and this is why I love groups because people will come in and chat and make their artwork and talk about it and things like that. Um, but after I left, they couldn't find a student to replace me. It's not exactly the most desirable or clinical, I guess, traditionally clinical place to work. Um, so one of the, the members of the group um, actually stepped up. And even though it, it's not necessarily like a art therapy group anymore, um, it's still an art group that happens twice a week on their terms. So they still like band together and like make artwork in this like really, really sweet group setting. That's amazing. Yeah, the, they like my clients inspire me just every day. Like <laughs> I'm so like, um, I feel like I just learn so much and get so much from working with people who love like to advocate for themselves and work on themselves and really like really do their best despite circumstances that may be out of their control. Yeah. It's, it's pretty inspiring. I think it's an amazing opportunity as somebody who loves art so much to be able to instill this like passion and for creativity in people. It must be really amazing. So we have one we have one question here. <laughs> Yay. Um, do you paint afterwards with images from your memory or do you sketch and paint while in the situation? I do as much sketching and painting within the situation as I can. I'm always like looking around a sketchbook with me in a pen or a pencil, whatever I have. But I do paint and draw a lot of images from just like pictures on my cell phone. Um, everyone has one, they're great sometimes. And they're like, they're not perfect quality. So they're, they can be fuzzy and more impression like. So it gives you a lot of opportunity to, to like put your own into it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I try my best to do it from life when I can. But a lot of the time it is from um, a photo document. Mm. Do you ever engage in art yourself through your therapy practices if somebody's afraid of getting started? Yeah, if someone's a bit nervous. I mean, therapy can be kind of awkward when they're drawing and I'm just sitting there observing them. <laughs> But um, in that case, like I'll do like a small piece um, so that I can also stay focused because I'm here for them. Ultimately, um, like I'll I'll do something small just to help people feel more comfortable. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, for anybody who is stuck at home, which a lot of people are right now, and they're looking to get creative in some way, um, do you have any advice for people getting started? Yeah, um, don't be scared to make anything ugly. <laughs> we all do it as part of the process. Um, when I get myself psyched out too much, I'm like, well, the first thing I make, it's been a few months since I've drawn. It's gonna be terrible. And I have to get over the fact that it's gonna be terrible and before I can move forward. Mm. So just be okay with being uncomfortable, being okay with things not looking the way you want it to look because art is hard and it's hard for whether you're starting off for the first time and wanting to get creative because of the pandemic, or if you've been painting for 50 years, it's still gonna be hard. <laughs> um, so accepting it, enjoying the challenge is a really big one. When you finally make something that you do really, really enjoy and you're proud of yourself for, it's gonna feel great because even though we only see like one piece, you know all the effort you did to get there. Yeah, definitely. How has the quarantine impacted you or has it yeah it's been <laughs> it was a little bit crazy um especially the first two weeks like again like i was excited to get back to toronto and be like um not go 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 again as i used to but just kind of get the ball rolling get my feet wet um i spent the time setting up my private practice which is really exciting um, I didn't expect to jump into it so soon, but like, since I have the time, I might as well do something with it. And I went into that. Um, there was I did make some art. Um, me, I have a, a studio that I share with a handful of brilliant artists from Toronto. Um, we're in the junction, and we've been designating days when each artist comes in, um, so we're physically distant from each other, and like we have the space to to feel safe making work. And it's been great. It's been getting me through the pandemic for sure. That's amazing. So we are unfortunately out of time. I don't ever know how an hour flies by so quickly, um, but it always does. So I'm just gonna leave your your website just in the side there. So if anybody wants to check out your work, um, they wanna learn a little bit more about you, um, 
you can find her work there. Um, and you also have, I assume, a, a page for your art therapy? Yeah, yeah, that's um, art therapy. Yeah. With my Amazing. Um, so thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking everything art therapy. Uh, it has been fantastic. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and just for anybody who's watching, who's been a part of the series, next week we will be interviewing Shanina Diana and talking about art activism and reducing stigma of mental health. Um, yeah, uh, number one fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, come back in next week. It'll be at 5 p.m., same as this week. And thank you everybody for tuning in, leaving comments, uh, asking questions, and yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you again for having me. Of course, it was amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi everybody, have an amazing weekend. <laughs>